good morning, Mosaic. We're so excited that you're here to join us for another awesome weekend. Uh, we just want to thank you again for your continuous generosity. You know, because of your generosity, we're able to do so many things here in this city. And as you see below me and as you'll see after the service, we have a multiple ways that you can partner with Mosaic. So during service, you know, you can take time to partner with us and continue to allow us to work through the mission of God here in the city of Conway, but also here in the United States. You know, we're so excited that we're able to have uh, Elena, Rico, and Asia lead worship for us today. Uh, they are just an awesome group of people that have just have a heart for Jesus, and they just reflect God's joy, and it's been so awesome working with them and just having them lead, especially as we're continuing on in our series, Through Joy. You know, we're continuing on through this series, and as we uh, jump back into worship and jump back into our series, I do want to leave you uh, with this passage in Psalms that just reflects God's goodness and how he continually provides for us. So I'll be reading from Psalms 104, starting with verse 10. So it says this, you make springs pour water into the ravines, so streams gush down from the mountains. They provide water for all the animals and the wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds nest beside the streams and sing among the branches of the trees. You send rain on the mountains from your heavenly home, and you will fill the earth with the fruit of your labor. You cause grass to grow for the livestock and plants for the people to use. You allow them to produce food from the earth, wine to make them glad, olive oil to smooth their skin, and bread to give them strength. The trees of the Lord are well cared for, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There are birds make their nest, and the storks make their homes in the cypresses. High in the mountains live the wild goats, and the rocks form the refuge for the hyraxes. You make the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to set. You send the darkness, and it becomes night, when all the forest animals prowl about. Then the young lion roars for their prey, stalking the food provided by God. At dawn, they slink back into their dens to rest. Then people go off to their work, where they labor until evening. O oh Lord, what a variety of things you, are, you have made. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the ocean, vast and wild, teeming with life of every kind. You both, large and small, seeing the ships sailing along the Leviathan which you made it to play in the sea. They all depend on you to give them food as they need. When you supply it, they gather it. You open your hand to feed them, and they are richly satisfied. So Mosaic and friends, you see, God provides for us in so many ways, and we are so joyful for that. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited that we are able to continue on in this series of joy. So as we continue on in worship, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you provide. We thank you that you are the one that can satisfy us. And so God, as we are just in this time of uncertainty, as we are just in this time of just not knowing, I just thank you that we can rest in your joy, that you can quench our thirst, that you can fill our bellies, that you can provide a roof over our heads. So we thank you for this time of joy. We thank you for this time of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Before 
told you last week that we were going to um, continue to be patient um, to wait on when we would come back and gather uh, here together. And our leadership team really pr- has been praying about this uh, so intensely and really talking through what it's the wise thing to do. And uh, if you're watching the news um, and those numbers continue to fluctuate and go up and sometimes down and then up again, uh, we just continue to feel like it's wisest to wait. And so as a leadership team, we've decided that really tentatively, we're going to be waiting for in-person gatherings, Sunday morning, in-person gatherings uh, to start potentially and tentatively for the month of August. Okay, so we're going to wait at least until the month of August. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to see each other. And so what's going to be coming your way in the next few weeks is we're going to publish on our Facebook page, which you're probably watching the service right now from our Facebook page. Uh, And if you are on this page, we're going to publish some get togethers that are going to be hosted by our small group leaders. And we're going to host a variety of those through the months of June and July. Um, Our our hope is that they would be uh, outdoors primarily if the weather permits. Uh, And they they would be uh, practicing good social distancing practices. But they provide opportunities to get together and fellowship together, to love on one another, to share our hearts together, uh, and just to see one another and to be in each other's presence. So be ready over the next week or so uh, to see some get-togethers published on this Facebook page, um, and that's going to be things that we do through the month of June and July. Additionally, starting in June, uh, our Mo Kids ministry is going to host what we call Super Saturdays, and it's going to happen on, on the second Saturday of June, and then from then on, on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month through the rest of the summer. Now, what's going to happen is our Mo Kids team is going to host an event right here next to the building outdoors, and it's going to happen on Saturday. June 13th will be the first one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Karen and the team is going to teach God's word. Um, There's going to be activities and snacks, and it's going to be an amazing time uh, for your kids on the parking lot over here next to the building. And so we just want to welcome you to continue to watch our Facebook page and our e-thread, and uh, and we'll continue to give you information about our Mo Kids Super Saturdays. You know, last week, uh, we began a series that's going to take us really for the rest of the summer um, that's focused on the theme of joy. And, And to really get at the theme of joy, we're looking at this little book in the Bible, the book of Philippians. And the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians, and he used the word joy or rejoice 15 times. It's pretty important to the theme of the book. And so uh, what we're getting at then is what is the deepest source of joy? You know, last week we talked about that there were different depths of joy we could reach and that we could pursue joy in sometimes what we would call shallow pools of joy and that we could also pursue joy in deeper pools of joy. And, you know, it's an interesting thing as I was thinking about that, I was thinking back to my college days and in my college days during the summer in Branson, Missouri, um, me and my friends would often try to find cliffs on on Lake uh, Table Rock. And uh, there's some great lakes there in Branson, and Table Rock is one of the better lakes. And uh, so we would go to Table Rock Lake, and we would begin looking for a cliff that we could jump off of. And sometimes the cliffs would be maybe 20 feet high. At times they would be uh, potentially uh, 40 feet high. Uh, Sometimes we could find one that was maybe even 50 or higher than that. And uh, we would look for these cliffs, and then we'd want to jump off the cliff uh, into the lake. And we're always kind of trying to see, you know, could we find a, a higher cliff to do that on? Now, if you know the higher a cliff goes, the more important it is that you have plenty of depth in the water. But sometimes we would just kind of um, not worry about that. You know, sometimes we'd get out there if it was a new spot and we would check it and we'd make sure that, that it had some depth to it and we would make sure that it would be safe to jump off a high cliff. But sometimes in some of the cliffs we went to, uh, we would have been there before and we wouldn't really worry that much about it. And there was one place that particularly we would jump from 
all the time. And it was one of our favorite places to jump. We used to go there all the time, week in and week out. And for several weeks, we had not gone to this spot. And one day, uh, we decided we want to go to this cliff. And so it was a warm day. It was a Saturday. Uh, me and my friends got together, and we went out to this spot, one of our favorite spots to go. And the cliff was about maybe 15 feet high. It wasn't one of the highest ones we'd ever jumped off of, but it wasn't very low either. And we got to that part of the cliff. We took all of our towels and everything to that part of the cliff. And uh, before we even went down to look back where the water was, uh, we just took a run off of the cliff to jump. Now. What had happened in the two weeks that we had not been to that particular place is that it hadn't rained in quite some time, uh, and the water level at Lake Table Rock had dropped significantly, and we had not been paying attention. So we were running off of that cliff, not looking below us, yelling and shouting and just excited to jump off this cliff, and then we hit the water. And that water had gone down a lot. So much so that the, really there was only about three feet of water. And we jumped off a 15 foot cliff into about three feet of water. And let me tell you, we went down hard. I bruised up my leg. I bruised up my backside. My back was bleeding. My arm was bleeding from the gravel and the bottom of the lake. I was beat up. In fact, I was lucky that I didn't get hurt worse than I did. Um, and we all came out of that water just, just ouch, and we were hurting and bleeding. That's a great example of what happens when we lean our lives into shallow pools of joy. They give real joy. They, they can really be um, sources of our happiness. In fact, a theologian named David Murray says that there's six places that the Bible talks about where God himself has provided places for us to get joy. Uh, things like our vocation, our jobs. Like those give us real joy. God created work and we get real joy from our work. But let me tell you this. If you lean your life into your job, if you lean your focus and your hope for ultimate joy from your job, it's going to be like jumping off a cliff sometimes and the water level has gone down and you're going to get beat up because it's too shallow joy for your ultimate satisfaction. You know, God's created relationships and, and so social relationships, those are so important. They're so valuable to us. But if we lean our lives into those social relationships, that even God has created. But if we lean our lives into those and we try to get ultimate joy from those relationships, we'll find that it's too shallow of a place. Our physical health, man, it feels good to be physically healthy. And there's so many things we can do that are so important for us to eat healthy and to exercise and to be out in the sunlight. There's so many important things for our physical health. But let me tell you, if you lean into your physical health as your ultimate source of joy, you'll find eventually it's too shallow a pool of joy. And it won't last when the pressure is on. And in fact, your physical health, your social relationships, your jobs and your achievements, pressure of life and just the brokenness of the world around us can really limit those pools of joy. And so though they are given to us by God, and even a passage that Randall read earlier from Psalms 104 that says that God provides our jobs and God provides food and drink and oil to put on our face and the skies and all of these things are for our good to strengthen our heart and to gladden our heart. Yet even though those things are from God, they're not ultimate. And because of the brokenness of sin, because of the way we have rebelled in the world, even those things that can provide some joy to us are broken. And if we lean into them for ultimate joy, we're going to find that they don't provide what we need. And so what we're really thinking through here is what's the deepest, what's the deepest source, the deepest pool of joy that we could go to, that we could find. And there were two places that we went to to kind of give us context for the book of Philippians. The first place was Psalm 67. Here's what Psalm 67 said. It said, may God be gracious to you. 
And would he bless us? And would his face shine upon us? That's so beautiful. We, even, we sang a song last week about the blessing of God, that God would bless us and his face would shine upon us. That your way, David says, would be known on the earth. And listen to this, your saving power, the New Testament's word for that is the gospel, your saving power, power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and you guide the nations upon the earth. What David says in Psalm 67 is that if you want the nations to shout for joy, if you want the nations to be glad in their heart, if you want the nations to be happy, truly and deeply happy, they need to experience the saving power of God. They need to experience the justice of God. And when the saving power of God is known on the planet, it has attached to it deep joy because the saving power of God rescues us from the things we have pursued for ultimate joy. It rescues us from the loneliness that we get when our social relationships have broken down. It rescues us from the feelings of feeling like a failure when our achievements have not lived up to everything they hoped they would be. The saving power of God comes in and says, even if you feel like a failure in your achievements, and even if your social relationships are broken down, and even if your own body is failing you, yet God loves you. And yet God blesses you. And yet God still can gladden your heart because that's what he does as God. The other passage we looked at for context was John 15. And John, Jesus said this in John 15. He said, I want you to abide in my love, verse 9 of John 15. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Jesus, I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, what? That my joy, that the joy of a happy God, that the joy of Jesus himself would be in you. So Jesus wants his love to be in you and you to be in his love. And then he wants his joy, the joy that he has in himself, the full joy in the heart of God, he wants that to be in you. So that your joy may be full. That's a deep, deep pool for joy. The joy of the saving power of God that can make the nations be glad and the joy of actual intimacy with Jesus where the love of Jesus is in us and the joy of Jesus is in us and because the joy and the love of Jesus is in us because we are living our lives in intimacy with Jesus, we have full joy. And it's the kind of joy that can withstand pressure. You know, pressure is an interesting thing. If you go to these shallower places of joy, if your whole significance is rooted in your physical health or your achievements or your social relationships, if, yours, if those are the sources of joy that you're living your life in, um, what's gonna happen that when pressure comes in, like we're living in right now, this pressure of, of living in the gaze of COVID and quarantine and social distancing where jobs are at risk and health is at risk and everything is different and no one even knows what the new normal is going to look like. All of that uncertainty is pressure. And, and if you're living your life in a shallow pool of joy, it can evaporate just like that. But if your life is rooted in understanding that you have been rescued by God into God's family and the saving power of God has been a real experience to you and your intimacy with Christ has grown so that the real joy of God is inside of you and filling you up because of your intimacy with him, then when you're under pressure, your joy is stable. 
And you know, what's interesting is, is we've seen in Paul, you know, in the first 11 verses, this is what he says. In fact, he says, I'm in prison, but I rejoice. How can he rejoice? He says, I rejoice because you, my family, my Jesus family, partnered with me in the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the power of God for salvation. The gospel is the rescue of God to redeem people from their sin and put them in right relationship with God. And he says, you work with me to make sure this salvation message gets out into the world. And in that, I rejoice. He said, I rejoice because I see God changing you. He said that God started a work in you, he said in, first, in chapter one. And he's going to take with that work in you and he's going to bring it to completion. That when he started this work in you, he hasn't left you alone and he's working inside of you. He said, he rejoice because we all receive God's grace together. And then he said at the end of verse 11, he said, or in verse 10, he said that I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus that's inside of me. I yearn for you. I love you because the love of God is living inside of me. And he said, I want your love to grow and grow and grow until the fruit of righteousness from God is full in you. That's very much what Jesus was saying in John chapter 15, that the love of Jesus working in us would grow until our love grew, that the joy of God was completely full in our lives. And Paul says, because those things are happening, because our love is growing for one another, because we're partnering together in this message of the gospel, because God's grace is coming into our lives, even though I'm in prison, I rejoice. I celebrate what God is doing in our lives. Can you celebrate what God's doing in your life right now? Can you celebrate the way that he's churning inside of you? The intimacy he's allowing to grow inside of you with him? Have you seen his work all around you? Have you seen the way that, that God has used the people that are in your life in unique ways to encourage you? Can you rejoice because the saving power of God is at work in your life? Can you rejoice because God's grace is at work in your life? That's what Paul says is happening. And that takes us into his perspective as he begins to pull back the curtain on his perspective on the pressure he's living under while he's in prison. And that takes us to, to verse 12 in chapter one of Philippians. And this is what Paul says. He says, I want you to know, brothers, and, 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 and he wants them to know because behind what he wants them to know is a concern that they don't know. In other words, he's concerned that their perception of Paul in prison is that Paul's not doing well. Their concern of Paul in prison is that he could be really disheartened. Their, 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 their concern for Paul is that in prison, he could be really deeply mistreated. And Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me, what's been going on to me, the fact that I'm in prison, has really served to advance the good news, to advance the gospel. And again, when we think gospel, you got to think, this is the saving power of God. In fact, in Romans 1.16, this is exactly what Paul said. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not afraid to tell anyone about the gospel. Why? Because the good news that Jesus became a man, that he lived on the earth, the perfect life, that he went to the cross and he died on the cross for our sin and that his blood makes us right with God. And when we trust in Jesus, he rescues us from our sin. He said that message of the good news of Jesus, I'm not ashamed of it because it's the saving power of God for anyone who believes. And he says, I want you to know, brothers, don't worry about me. What's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. In other words, he's in prison in Rome. He's in house arrest. The imperial guard watches over him. And he says the whole imperial guard, that means Caesar's imperial guard, the guard that serves 
the emperor, that whole imperial guard, and to all the rest in that area where he's being imprisoned, they know that my imprisonment is for Christ. That's a wild statement. In other words, he says that I was grabbed against my will. I was put in prison against my will because I was preaching Jesus. And yet, I want you to know that right where I'm standing and right where I'm living, though I have not the freedom to move as I want, though I don't have the freedom to get up and to leave and to do what I want, I can eat when they tell me to eat. I sleep when they tell me to sleep. I can't leave the area on my own. And I want you to know, Paul says, that has served so that the whole imperial guard knows about the saving power of Jesus. You know, what's interesting about that to me? That Jesus loved those Roman soldiers so much that he took the greatest missionary at the time and stuck him in prison with them. And that the greatest missionary of the first century is excited that his time in prison is allowing him to share the saving power of God to Roman soldiers. That's amazing that God would care enough on the planet to look at all the people on the planet and to see these Roman soldiers and think to himself, I want the saving power of God to go to these Roman soldiers. I want them rescued from paganism. I want them rescued from a life of not knowing me. I want them rescued from a life living for themselves. And so I'm going to take the greatest missionary on the planet. His name's Paul, and he's telling everybody about Jesus, and I'm going to put him in prison so that these soldiers would come to know Jesus. That's amazing perspective for Paul. And he has so much joy in that. You know, my question is, in these days of pressure, where we haven't been able to go where we want, you know, Americans hate that. We hate being told we can't go somewhere. We hate being told we can't do something. We hate being told that we're not allowed to do this and we have to do this. And Americans, we're so independent. We, we, just, we just don't want anyone to tell us what to do. But have you ever stopped to think in the middle of where you are right now with the restrictions and the way life's going on for you right now, have you ever stopped to think that it could be that everything that's reined you in right now has put you in a place where you could share about the saving power of Jesus with somebody? Is there somebody you've been on a Zoom call maybe with where you would get the opportunity to share about the saving power of Jesus? Is there somebody in your neighborhood that maybe you haven't really had a deep conversation with that you have had an opportunity to talk more with and to go deeper with than you ever did before and you've had an opportunity to maybe share about the saving power of Jesus? Maybe we shouldn't be so frustrated about the things we can't do and more excited about the opportunity to do what we can do because of exactly where we have to be. Paul can't go anywhere. And yet he is thrilled at the way the saving power of Jesus is being extended because he is where he is. Where are you? It could be that you haven't been able to leave home. And so you get an opportunity more than you've ever had in your life to look at your kids and tell them about the love of Jesus. To talk to them about how Jesus impacts the way they do their homework. To talk to them about how Jesus impacts the way they play. To talk to them about the way Jesus impacts the way they love their siblings. You've had more time than ever. Instead of being frustrated... Could you maybe think, ah, God, I'm here with my kids. And I get an opportunity from morning till night to explain the saving power of Jesus in their life. This is Paul's perspective, and it's amazing. And then he he says this other amazing thing happens because of his imprisonment. He says in verse 14, and most of the brothers, in other words, these other, the, the, the men and women who love Jesus, they have become confident in the Lord because they see me in prison. 
that's an interesting thing. Well, what does that mean? It, it means that the other brothers and sisters who saw Paul get grabbed, shackled, and taken to prison, and they've been watching from afar what's happening to Paul in prison, and as they watch what's going on in Paul's life while he's in prison, their confidence in God grows. Their faith in God grows. Now, what does that even look like? Well, let me tell you a couple of things I think it looks like. I think they're seeing when Paul's in prison that even in the place where Paul's in prison, God provides. God's still providing. Even though Paul's in prison, God's still providing. I think their confidence growing that, that even though Paul's in prison and the government's kind of oppressing the movement of Jesus, they realize they can endure. Have you realized that you're going to make it? And these weeks, these long weeks of wondering what's going to happen with the world around us, has it ever occurred to you that you're making it? That God is still sustaining you? That God is still working in you? That you're still moving forward? that you're still growing, that you're still changing? Has it ever occurred to you that God is sustaining you and that you can endure through this because God's working in your life? I think their confidence that God grows. As Paul's in prison, their confidence grows. We can endure. We're going to make it. I think their confidence grows um, that they can lead. See, as long as Paul was out teaching and leading, they followed Paul's lead. But now Paul's in prison. And because Paul's in prison, look what it says. It says that they became confident in the Lord by his imprisonment, he says, and they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. In other words, Paul's in prison, and they see Paul in prison preaching the gospel to Roman soldiers, and the confidence in their heart grows. And they say, I can lead. And you better believe that while Paul was in prison, some pastors rose up. You better believe that while Paul was in prison, some evangelists rose up. You better believe that when Paul was in prison, some elders grew up. Their confidence in the Lord grew so that they could speak boldly the word without fear. They saw Paul in prison, their leader in prison, taken away from their fellowship. And as they see him joyful in his situation, their confidence in God rose. That is so counterintuitive, but it's exactly the way joy in the Lord works. It's exactly the way the stable love and power of God, when we are intimate with God, works in our life. It looks right into those places of pressure. And instead of letting the pressure crush us, it flips the pressure on its head and it grows. And this is the way the movement of God has always grown, by the way. From the fifth, fifth century through all of church history, the church has always exploded under pressure. The character of the people of God grow under pressure, the ministries grow under pressure. All you have to do is look at places like China when the government has oppressed the church to see the church explode in the underground church. You've seen the same thing in India. You've seen the same thing in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, where, the, where the, the church is oppressed and when there's pressure on the church, it grows. The character of the people grow. The confidence of the believers grow in the Lord. This is what happens when we're rooted in God and the pool of joy that we go to is deeper than just our social relationships, our achievements, our physical health. When it's deeper than those things, when pressure comes on, we're able to flip the script and flip the narrative. And, and it says they became confident in the Lord. And in the Lord is so important because not only did they become confident that God could provide, not only did they become confident that they could lead, not only did they become confident that they were going to endure the pressure, but they become confident in God himself. That when they saw what God was doing in Paul, they said, God, you can be trusted. 
You can be trusted. I can rely on you. Look at what you're doing in Paul's life. Look at the way you're using the pressure Paul's under. Look at the way you're using his imprisonment. I can trust you. God can be trusted. You don't have to run in this season of pressure. In this season, you don't have to run to addiction. You don't have to run to loneliness. You don't have to run to pornography. You don't have to run to the things that you think you need to feel okay about yourself. You can run to Jesus himself. He can be trusted. And he can work in your life in this moment to provide deep, satisfying joy. And that's what happens to them. They become confident in the Lord. Then in verse 15, he runs into another group, not the brothers, but another group. He says, some indeed preach Jesus from envy and rivalry. Now, now you got to stop for here and say, well, who who are the some that preach Jesus from envy or rivalry? It it seems to be, scholars tell us, that there was a group of, of people who did not know Jesus and they were antagonistic to the Jesus movement. In other words, they didn't want the church to grow. And what they thought was, is that if we also preach Jesus, that'll get Paul in more in trouble. They'll they'll treat Paul worse in prison if we preach Jesus. Now, I know that sounds weird, but their thinking was kind of messed up. And what they thought was, well, Paul's in prison because of Jesus. If we talk more about Jesus, they'll beat Paul worse. It's kind of strange. Their motives are terrible, but they're preaching Jesus from envy, Paul says. He says, there's this group of people and they're preaching Christ from envy and rivalry. He says, but then there's some of the brothers who do it from goodwill. He goes, the latter do it out of love. The ones that do it from goodwill, they do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the good news. But the former, they proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? And this is a critical phrase. You got two groups of people. You got the brothers whose confidence in God is growing and they speak the word boldly. And you got this group trying to afflict Paul, a group who doesn't know Jesus, but they're preaching Jesus. They're telling about the good news of Jesus. They're talking about the cross of Jesus. They're talking about the saving power of Jesus, but they don't even love Jesus. They just want Paul to get beat more in prison. And Paul goes, what then? I've got one group that preaches Jesus out of love. These are my brothers. I got another group trying to get me hurt more. But they're preaching Jesus thinking that's going to get me in more trouble. What then? What do I think about that, Paul says? And look at what he says. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Jesus Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So whether some people are talking about Jesus because they have bad motives, or the brothers preach Jesus because their confidence in God is growing, no matter what, Jesus is being Proclaim the saving power of God is being told to people. And that I celebrate in. And here's why. This is the big idea. Jesus proclaimed leads to Jesus gained. Jesus proclaimed leads to Jesus gained. And when Jesus is gained, the love of Jesus fills our broken hearts and the joy of Jesus comes to full pool. And Paul says, if Jesus getting proclaimed is coming from somebody with bad motives, I don't care because Jesus proclaim leads to Jesus gained. And when Jesus is gained, real joy that can blow through every circumstance comes filling into the human heart. And when it gets to your heart, you will be new. You will be whole. You will be free. And you will be accepted by a God who loves you. And Paul goes, in that reality, I rejoice. Because Jesus gained 
is the whole shooting match. Jesus known, Jesus loved, Jesus followed. And the life of Jesus working in us is everything. And that gives us a joy that cannot be shaken. You know, last week, I challenged you that if you don't know this Jesus, to put your faith in Jesus. The Jesus we're talking about right now, the Jesus that can provide so much joy that even though Paul's in prison, he can rejoice. A Jesus that can provide so much joy that even if you lose your job, you can rejoice. A Jesus that is so rich in love for you that even if your own physical body deteriorated today, which you have no control over, by the way, that even if that happened, you could rejoice. Jesus wants you to know him. He wants to rescue you from your sin. He wants to reach in and bring healing into your life. He wants to bless you. He wants his face to shine upon you. And he wants you to be glad and he wants you to rejoice. And you can know that joy by coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, please forgive me for my rebellion against you. Forgive me for trying to live life on my own. Forgive me for my sin. Please come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross. You died for me and your blood makes me a new person. It gives me new righteousness and makes me whole. Put your confidence in the cross of Jesus and watch God come into your life through the power of the Holy Spirit and make you new, bring you from death to life. Put your confidence in Jesus right now. Jesus, we pray that there would be some right now who do not know you, that right now their heart would grow and leap to put their confidence in you. And we pray for those of us who know you, God, that we would look at the pressure we're under and we would lean into you as the deepest source of our joy. We let our confidence in you grow as we see what you're doing on planet Earth in our lives and around us. Help us to get excited about where you've placed us. Help us to get joyful about what you're doing through us right where we are. God, would you help us see these realities and help us to trust you in Jesus' name. to
Center of it all. 